It's uh, lovely to welcome you all and to see a full auditorium. My name is Rod Garner. I'm chair of the Blanche Trustees. This is my fourth year I've had the opportunity to do this. Looking round, I can see lots of familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, you are in for a special evening. You'll be able this evening to lift your eyes to the hills, as the good book says, and uh, considerably higher. But uh, more of uh, Professor David uh, a little later. <coughs> As Chair of the Trustees, I have to make a formal vote of thanks and appreciation on this occasion to the people here at Hope University at all levels from the Chancellor down for the splendid opportunities they give us here to share in their life and work, the hospitality, the amenities, all of which is given as a, a gospel gesture of generosity. We're very grateful indeed, and it reflects the close and creative relationship between the University and the Diocese of Liverpool. And obviously we hope this is our 23rd year of the Blanche Lecture. If you are brand new to this occasion, uh, Archbishop Blanche Stuart was Bishop of this Diocese several decades ago, and it was thought fit to honour his name and memory by doing these annual events. I want to say just a brief word of thanks to Jackie uh, Sanders, the events coordinator from the university, who has just come in to remind me that someone was double parked. Um, <laughs> she does fantastic work working with us. I want to thank uh, also Christina barrett Yuan, our diocesan person who's helping here this evening. This is her first time helping us to organise this event. She's done it very well. And also, just very briefly, to honour uh, Margaret Short, who left the diocese um, a few months ago and for many years was a very able and effective coordinator with myself and other people in, in making this annual event happen. <laughs> Thank you to all of those. And I want to invite Dr Guy... <coughs> Cuthberton, Head of the School of Humanities, to the lectern to say a word of welcome on behalf of the University. Hello. I will be very brief. Um, you've, you're not, I'm not the reason why you've come here today, but it's so lovely to see so many people here. Um, welcome to Liverpool Hope University. Um, as Rod said, my name's Guy Cuthbertson. I'm the Head of the School of Humanities here, and theology is one of the subjects within <laughs> humanities, so I have the the honour of welcoming you uh, to this wonderful event, and you're all very welcome. Um, it's also our 175th anniversary at Liverpool Hope this year, so it's been a, a year of special events and occasions, and it's lovely to have this one in amongst um, our 175th year. Um, we're also delighted to be hosting the event and to be welcoming uh, this, this year's speaker, the Reverend Professor David Wilkinson, who we will hear from in a moment. Later on, you'll also be hearing from my colleague, uh, Dr Peter McGrail, uh, who is in our theology, philosophy and religious studies area within humanities. So that's enough for me, but thank you very much for coming here and it's great to see a lecture theatre full, as it always is with students, obviously. Um, <laughs> but um, it's lovely to see a full room um, and you will all be paying attention and taking notes and um, I will hand you back to Rod. Thank you very much. One of the traditions of this evening in the opening formalities is to invite uh, a person to do a reading from Archbishop Blanche's uh, writings. And this year, Elsa Newton, who is the head girl, appropriately at the Archbishop Blanche School, um, is going to do that for us. I want to preface that just with a short opening prayer. And given the uh, nature of our lecture this evening, it seemed appropriate to offer a prayer for creation in its widest and most rich sense. We thank you, Lord of all creation, for the wonder of the world in which we live, for the earth and the planets and all that spring from them, for the mystery of life and growth. We pray that our gratitude may be shown by our care to conserve the powers of the soil by our readiness to learn from scientific research, and by our concern for a fair distribution of the Earth's resources. We ask all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
So if Elsa would like to come to the lectern now and read for us. The Bible does not have to be understood in its totality before parts of it can speak powerfully to the individual seeker. As one wise man, Mark Twain, I think has said, it is not the parts of the scripture that I don't understand that worry me, it is the parts that I do understand. The Bible has proved over the centuries its extraordinary powers to awaken the mind, to challenge the spirit and to impose a new way of life upon the reader. But just to say that is to leave the reader dependent upon his own experience unarmed against the serious criticisms that can be urged against the Bible by those both within and outside the Church of God. If he is to remain a faithful servant, and indeed to become a faithful witness, he must come to grips with the problems and find a satisfying answer to them. It is to this question that I now address myself, and I can only proceed by way of illustration. Carl Jung tells a story of how he acquired some land in the Swiss Alps, and there proceeded to build himself a house. He offered good psychological explanations why he built it the way he did. For him, it was a unity arising out of and expressing his deepest innermost needs. But to the outsider, it must have seemed a strangely ramshackle construction built haphazardly over the years. <coughs> Carl Jung was neither an architect nor a builder by profession and the construction left a lot to be desired. What mattered to him was the view which brought solace to a troubled mind. And this is important, was unique. No other house could ever again command such a view. It was his alone. Some such analogy might be applied with profit to the Bible. It is so the critics would urge a ramshackle production. But my <coughs> reply to them would be the reply I put on the lips of Carl Jung when his own ramshackle house was criticised. It is the view that matters. <coughs> Thank you, Elsa, for a <coughs> provocative extract from his writings. <coughs> so to our speaker, it's my genuine pleasure <coughs> to be able to introduce to you Professor David Wilkinson and to offer him a genuinely warm welcome, uh, welcome from Liverpool, from the university, from the cathedral, and of course from here at Hope University. He has in the relatively recent past accepted other invitations to come and speak with us and it's been my privilege to hear him and also introduce him on an occasion just a few years ago. He needs no welcoming really to the uh, area. Those of you know of him or know him that much earlier in life um, he had a scientific career uh, in this part of the world. He was a Methodist minister in Liverpool and also chaplain to the University of Liverpool. His current roles, and he has many apart from these which I'm going to remind you of, is as a principal of St. John's College, Durham, and also professor in the Department of Theology and Religions at the same university. These posts enable him to combine his passions, and his passions for science, for theology, contemporary culture, and the interface between these three discrete things. He is an author and a regular contributor to Radio 4 Thought for the Day. You remember that when John Humphreys uh, stepped down recently, he described that slot in the Radio 4 schedule, which he endured for many years, as deeply, deeply boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor David is one of the glorious exceptions uh, to, to that uh, comment. If you do tune in, uh, he invariably invests what he has to say with intelligence, imagination, and a gentle humour. His Durham PhD, he has two, he might have three since I last saw him, I think he seems to acquire them, but his Durham PD was on the formation of stars, the evolution of galaxies, and ter ter terrestrial mass extinctions. It's uh, quite a Trinitarian <laughs> uh, description, isn't it? Um, a few years ago, very recently in fact, um, he wrote this splendid book, Science, Religion and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. This is my copy signed by him 
and since he signed it, I will show it him later, it's a heavily annotated book. There are remarks and underlinings all over the place. But I wanted to underline one and read it this evening because it brings him to the stage. At one point he quotes Professor Jacques Monod who wrote um, for some an alarming book a generation ago called Chance and Necessity. And uh, he, wrote, he wrote as an atheist and a scientist and a cosmologist. And Monod wrote this. Man at last knows that he is alone in the unfeeling <coughs> immensity of the universe out of which he has emerged only by chance. David shares one scientific convention, conviction with Professor Mono, and that is that we are indeed finding ourselves in the centre of immensities. But for David, this is exciting and it opens up new vistas for science and theology. It is a great pleasure to invite our speaker on the theme of Christ, cosmos and creation and how they hang together. Uh, Rod, thank you very much indeed and um, my thanks to the Vice-Chancellor and uh, to Liverpool Hope on such a, uh, a year of the 175th anniversary. I'm delighted to be here and the work that has been done here and indeed uh, an affection for the Diocese of Liverpool and uh, indeed the Christian community at Liverpool that taught me so much over many years. I'm grateful to be back. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Although I think with the combination of Elsa and Rod, there's very little else for me to say. Uh, it's been said all so eloquently already. I'm not sure that I think all I'm going to do for the next three hours or so is uh, just do a little commentary on uh, what's already been said. Um, I have to say that uh, it's a particular delight to give this lecture in memory of Archbishop Blanche uh, uh, in the presence of his uh, biographer. Um, I just wondered whether his, uh, his little passage about the tyranny of politicians might have been read this evening um, for, for, for um, some reason, perhaps, that's going on in our country, uh, but that was a very appropriate um, phrase. I've always uh, um, been attracted to Blanche for a number of reasons, a sense of, uh, it was often said of him, he was a layman at heart, I like that. Um, a trusted evangelical. He was clearly uh, knew where he was, but uh, there were others from different parts of the theological spectrum that find, found authenticity uh, within his work, and indeed as a theological teacher. And I was interested uh, to see that in Desert Island Discs in 1976, um, when he was interviewed by Roy, Roy Plumley. Uh, amongst the varied music that he chose, from Fiddler on the Roof uh, to uh, a Dirty Old Town, uh, he had a reading of John chapter 1, the prologue to John, which sets Jesus within the cosmic uh, scenario, the cosmic perspective, the cosmic sphere, as an introduction then to read uh, those stories of the life of Jesus as a clue to decode them and to understand them. And in a sense, what I'm going to try and do this evening uh, is to do a similar thing. I'm going to take a very similar passage from the New Testament, which is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how one can weave that through an understanding, particularly of my own academic subject, uh, which is astrophysics, theoretical astrophysics. I'm sure you all know what that is, by the way, don't you? Uh, it's twinkle, twinkle, little star, <laughs> how I wonder what you are. It's uh, very straightforward in that sense, although astrophysicists reply up above the world so high, a contracting ball of hot hydrogen gas undergoing nuclear fusion. It doesn't quite scan in the same way. But Paul wrote these words to a group of Christians in Colossae. Uh, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, there are many in our culture who would say, um, well, that's pretty irrelevant to the kind of issues that we have today, uh, as that piece beautifully illustrated. Uh, is this of relevance at all? It seems a little ramshackle in a world now that's very different. And you get that within popular culture. Let me give you just a few examples of that, if I may. This is the stand-up comedian Dara O'Brien talking about uh, belief in creation. Because I'm not a man for text and holding to text really strictly, like laws and rules and regulations, and the Bible thing in particular. For God's sake, we've moved on, right? If you're a religious person, fine, go for that, whatever you're into. But at least in this part of the world, we don't take it literally. There's no way like there is in America going, no, no, Genesis is a historical fact. And you're going, for God's sake, Genesis was just a load of fairy stories to get the kids to go to bed on a donkey ride to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, right? <laughs> Stop taking it literally. It's only the Bible. It's not gospel. <laughs> not every word in it is supposed to be true, right? For God's sake. And they, people give out about evolution, right? This wonderful thing that we invented and we came up with this fantastic theory to explain incredibly complex things. And people go, no, no, it's not in the book. It can't be right. How could, and they, on their little arguments, creationist arguments, like, you, how could the eye just have evolved? It must be a gift from God. And you're going, no, oh, you're not getting the point. The whole point of evolution is that random things just happened and the useful ones hung around, right? Basically, there were loads of blind monkeys. <laughs> And then one day, a one-eyed monkey wandered into the middle of it all and rode everything left, right and centre. <laughs> and he was king of the monkeys until Mr Feckin' Two Eyes sashayed into the clearing. <laughs> it's a wonder I'm not invited to more churches in Alabama to hear that speech. <laughs> but it's just the press people go, no, God made boof, boof, there you go, God made us exactly as we are, right? No, of course he didn't, for God's sake. Three arguments up against that. A, have a look at yourself. <laughs> if you truly think you were created by God, get out of the shower in the morning and look at yourself for a while in the mirror. This is the same guy, apparently, who made mountaintops and sunsets. What kind of off day exactly was he having <laughs> when he threw you together? <laughs> Argument two, if we were truly created by God, then why do we still occasionally bite the insides of our own mouths? <laughs> less divine than when you suddenly go, ah, oh, I should have bitten my thumb on the inside of my mouth. <laughs> I seem to have chewed at my cheek there. I seem to have forgotten where my lips were. I was so eager to eat that place of pasta, I've eaten through my own face. <laughs> and argument C against the divine creator, the appendix. Why would he put it in you when it does nothing except randomly kill you for no good reason? <laughs> Just sit there doing nothing and then fall apart and kill him. Kill him now! Of course, so Brian has a degree in physics, astrophysics, uh, and he's one of many uh, comedians who have followed the legacy of new atheism mm -hmm. in positing a conflict between science and religion. You find it in Ricky Gervais, you find it in Eddie Izzard, you find it in O'Brien. And this is true on the other side of the Atlantic as well. I'm a great fan of the Big Bang Theory. I mean, not just the scientific theory, of course, but also the comedy series. And as some of you know, following the end of the Big Bang Theories, there's a spin-off series called Young Sheldon, which charts the childhood of Sheldon Cooper, the great physicist, in six-day creationist Texas. And uh, there in uh, his childhood, he starts to form a friendship, perhaps, with the local church minister, Pastor Jeff. 
And this is the first moment that Sheldon meets Pastor Jeff. Sometimes people say to me, Pastor Jeff, how do you know there's a God? And I say it's simple math. God either exists or he doesn't. So let's be cynical. Worst case scenario, there's a 50-50 chance. And I like those odds. That's wrong. Shelly, put your hand down. Sorry, please continue. It's OK, Mary. It's Sheldon, right? Yes, sir. Well, Sheldon, why don't you come on up here and tell me how I'm wrong? No. OK. <laughs> let's give him a hand, everybody. What's happening? Shelly's going to eat him alive. <laughs> so, you were saying? You've confused possibilities with probabilities. According to your analogy, when I go home, I might find a million dollars on my bed, or I might not. In what universe is that 50-50? So what do you think the odds are that God exists? I think they're zero. I believe in science. So you don't think science and religion can go hand in hand? Science is facts. Religion is faith. I prefer facts. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Here's a cool fact for you. A lot of famous scientists believed in God. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, even Charles Darwin. So Darwin's right about God and wrong about evolution? Now you're getting it. Let's give it up for Sheldon, everybody. What a good sport. Oh. But I wasn't a good sport. At that moment, I vowed to come back the following Sunday and destroy Pastor Jeff. Let me just say that there will be questions later on uh, for the evening. If you want to destroy me, they're very welcome to do so. Um, of course, the conflict model between science and religion posits that old divide that science is all about facts and theology is somehow about faith. Mm, those of us who've grown to learn and understand the Christian faith will know that that's not quite the case, and yet the culture presents that time after time. Uh, my third illustration, and then I'll get to normal lecturing style if that's all right, uh, is uh, Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss uh, uh, talking about the value of theology. Uh, to any academic institution. Theology, it seems to me, unlike those other, other humanities that, do, that you mentioned, is not a subject at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's an embarrassment, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, I, as I, Jefferson I, said, as Jefferson said, a, a, a professor of divinity has no place in our university. And he created a university, exactly. Yeah. And I agree with you 100%. I, I, I put out a challenge, and maybe some people here can try and match it. I've challenged theologians to give me a single example of a contribution to human knowledge that theology has provided in the last 500 years. And when I talk to major theologians, and I do, believe it or not, um, the answer I always get is, what do you mean by knowledge? And, and I, I point out if I talk to a biologist or a historian or a psychologist, I get concrete answers, but they give me this epistemological... No anyway. Okay. But, uh, but, I, but I, I do think we need to, to add to that, that that professors of theology often do extremely worthwhile things. Biblical history, liter history. Uh, biblical liter literary criticism, um, um, archaeology of, of, of Palestine. These are all thoroughly reputable and, and good things. When, when I said theology is not a subject at all, I meant things like the theology of the transubstantiation of the Trinity, etc. Et That's not a subject at all. But, but of course, many people who are professors of theology don't do that sort of nonsense. They do proper academic studies of, of biblical history and, and literature and so on. Well, I come to you as one of those awful types of professor of theology. Uh, by the way, transubstantiation of the Trinity, Dawkins is absolutely right. It's not a subject <laughs> at all. Um, and yet, does Christian systematic theology have anything to say to us? And does it have a place in uh, important universities such as this? Well, let me defend Christian theology this evening, but more than just defend it. Uh, say that it has a positive contribution that goes beyond the conflict model of science and religion, and actually is a dialogue partner to our scientific understanding of the universe. 
something that it receives but also gives. And you'll hear the passage from Colossians uh, in the background as we go through, just as uh, for Blanche, the uh, prologue to John was the center point of his Desert Island Discs. Is that all right with everyone? I hope it is. That's what I've prepared, so uh, <laughs> it hasn't. Um, so what does the Christian doctrine of creation look like? Uh, what might it say uh, in terms of its understanding of the universe? The first thing to note, and it seems to me to be important to say, that it is not an abstract academic concept. Often when scripture talks about God as creator, it's not trying to solve an intellectual problem. It's there for encouragement of those going through difficulty. It's there to challenge those who would uh, believe or exalt idols. And particularly it's there to engender worship. Uh, so for instance, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, as you know, within the ongoing discussion between those Christians who believe in a six-day creation model and others, seems to me to uh, misinterpret the first chapter of Genesis. For me, the first chapter of Genesis is not a scientific text. It's a theological text, or I would push it to say that it's actually a hymn of worship. And so that uh, if you had the writer of Genesis here as your lecturer this evening, and you asked the question, how old is the universe? I suspect the answer is, to be honest, I'm not really interested in that. What I'm interested in is that you understand the greatness of God and get caught up in worship of this creator God. Be excited by this creator of the universe. And that's true also of that passage from Colossians 1, where many scholars will say that Paul may have adapted an early Christian hymn uh, in a way to uh, liturgically celebrate uh, who Jesus is. And it seems to me that there is something always about Christian theology, which as Dan Hardy many years ago used to say, is about worship. One can't do theology without that sense that it is tinged with worship. Uh, and we sometimes demote our Christian understanding to a purely academic uh, discussion. Uh, the second thing to say um, is uh, for the Christian doctrine of creation, Christ is at the center. So Paul begins his discussion uh, in Colossians by talking about Christ being the image of the invisible God. Uh, and we'll go on to talk about how the fullness of Christ was pleased to encompass the fullness of God, that the fullness of God dwelt in him. It's a quite incredible uh, image of who Christ is. And so as Christians are asked the question, what is God like? Christians reply, he is like Jesus. Christ is the image of the invisible God. And again, it seems to me that for many of us, that may be fairly obvious, but it's something that we bring into the public domain to say that we know God through God revealing God's self. That is not simply an intellectual philosophical pursuit of God, but God takes the initiative to speak of God's self to us. And if you look back in some of the history of the relationship between science and faith, you see sometimes that that is uh, misunderstood or at times ignored. Uh, two or three centuries ago, uh, the design argument was very popular in intellectual and Christian circles. It had its high point, of course, with William Paley in a book called Natural Theology, where Paley famously talked about if I walk across a field and I find a watch, I pick the watch up and it looks designed. Therefore, there must be a designer. And he took that and applied it to the natural world and said, when I look at the natural world, the biological world, it looks designed. Therefore, there is a designer. And this was a growth industry at the time. Uh, the Bridgewater Treatise 
John Ray's book about the fly's eye and how it spoke of the benevolence and goodness of God. Uh, this was where the theology was at the time. And then, of course, uh, although Immanuel Kant and David Hume as philosophers had criticized the design argument that you couldn't move from uh, the biological world to talk about a good and loving God and the many other philosophical problems, of course, no one had really uh, uh, followed them. It was only when Charles Darwin came along and said that that which you think is designed actually has an alternative explanation in terms of natural selection, that the trying to prove God through design started to fall apart. And I think with good reason, because the Christian faith isn't based on the intellectual attempt to prove God. And when Dawkins uh, talks about the limit n limited nature of the cosmological argument, the design argument, and the ontological argument. And if you don't understand the ontological argument, then join me in. I don't understand it either. But he's quite right to point out the limitations of those kind of attempts for us to reach God. Uh, Karl Barth famously said, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, in order to perceive and to understand that God the Almighty, the Father, is creator of heaven and earth. If I did not believe the former, I could not perceive and understand the latter. And I have to say, with respect to Professor Dawkins, that's a fundamental problem within Dawkins' critique of Christian faith. In The God Delusion, his famous uh, bestseller, in chapter 2, uh, he makes a, a fundamental theological shift. It's quite subtle, but it becomes a very important shift for the rest of the book. What he says is, he's not out to criticize any particular religion, whether it be Jesus uh, or etc., 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 but he's going to talk about God in the general. And then that's what he does. He criticizes the general arguments for the existence of God. Now that's the shift. He's moved from the particular to the general. Christianity is a religion of particularity about a particular set of events where God has spoken. Just as within the Jewish understanding, there are a particular set of acts that God has done in history. And for those who are Within the Muslim community, God has spoken in a particular way. You've got to take these faith communities in their own integrity. You can't simply generalize. And Christianity is a, a, a faith about God who speaks. And therefore, within our own Christian community, you will know that a movement has developed in recent years called intelligent design. <coughs> and uh, I don't want to step on anyone's toes here this evening, uh, although I'm going to. Um, <laughs> and that is simply to say that this renewal of trying to prove God through gaps within science or the need to have information put into the evolutionary development just seems to me to be misguided. It, of course, is produced out of the politics of six-day creationism in the U.S., not having a place in the classroom. And so a big tent of intelligent design of those religious folk and those who didn't like evolution was formed in order to argue that there were rational arguments that would get into the classroom. And it seems to me that there are two major problems with it. The first is, I've already mentioned, a God of the gaps type scenario. But the second is that there is no place for Jesus Christ in all of this, in knowing who God is. I think the same is true within a more general movement, not intelligent design, but has tried to um, uh, remind us of the importance of design in what uh, Paul Davis calls the Goldilocks enigma. 
These are things about the universe that are just right for you and me to exist. Famously in the 1960s, Fred Hoyle uh, with uh, Golden Bondi produced a, a model of the universe which was called the steady state model, no beginning to it. And part of their motivation for that was to avoid the theistic implications of the Big Bang. Hoyle himself went on a bit of a journey towards the late 60s. He and a number of others worked on where the uh, atoms such as carbon and oxygen and nitrogen come from. And in a brilliant piece of work for which Hoyle, in my humble opinion, should have got the Nobel Prize and never did, uh, discovered that these uh, atoms are produced in the death throes of stars, supernova explosions. When stars run out of hydrogen, they start burning anything that they can, and you form carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And Hoyle discovered this, but he also saw that these things are very finely balanced. They have to be just right. The energy levels in carbon are only different by 2%. <coughs> the energy levels in oxygen are only different by half a percent. Then there's no carbon in the <coughs> universe. That's quite important to you and me because we're made of the stuff. He wrote after that, nothing has shaken my atheism as much as this discovery. And in fact, on into the 1980s, he then wrote a book called The Intelligent Universe. Now, he wasn't arguing for any Christian view of God. What he was arguing for was a deeper story to the universe. And this, again, has become the kind of growth area in popular science and religion in lots of ways. Uh, the astronomer royal, Martin Rees, uh, some years ago wrote a book called Just Six Numbers. Six numbers that have to be just right for us to exist. Don't worry, those of you who are getting worried, we're not going to go through the equations on this tonight. Um, but at the end of the book, he said, in the light of this, you've got three options, says Lord Rees. Option one, you just say, well, that's the way it is, and walk away from it. No, says uh, Lord Rees, you can't do that because these balances are so extraordinary. Option two, he says, you say God created the universe. And this is evidence of God. But he doesn't like that. His own preference is option three. And that is that we are one of many universes in a multiverse of universes. And we're here because the things are just right, but there are many other universes in which things aren't right. Now, I think the attempt to try and use these Goldilocks enigmas to prove the existence of God runs the same danger as what John Ray and William Paley were doing in the 19th century. They don't work. But more than that, they begin to try and build logical proofs without any concept of revelation of God speaking. If you're interested in the multiverse and you want to talk more, let's do that in the questions. I can see some of you are eager and most of you aren't. But uh, I've been doing a little bit of work uh, in Durham with uh, this uh, gentleman recently. This is Temple Chevalier. And Temple Chevalier was the first professor of astronomy at Durham University. Not only was he professor of astronomy, he was also professor of mathematics and reader in Hebrew all at the same time. He was a little cheesed off that he wasn't a professor of Hebrew. He only got to readership. As well as that, he was uh, um, area dean, canon at the cathedral, university registrar. Uh, he was also vicar of Esh Parish Church for a number of years. Remember, there wasn't any television in those days. Um, and uh, a brilliant astronomer. He has a crater on the moon named after him. He did fundamental work on sunspots. Um, and uh, he published this book, of which we've got uh, in Durham University Library, uh, called On the Proofs of Divine Power and Wisdom Derived from the Study of Astronomy and the Evidence, Doctrines, and Precepts of Reli Revealed Religion. Now, the story of Chevalier is very interesting for a number of reasons. It's a contemporary of Darwin. He read Paley at Cambridge, as everyone did uh, at Cambridge. He lost a child 
roughly the same time that Darwin lost Annie Darwin, which was significant for Darwin's own uh, Christian faith. But what Chevalier does in the 19th century with the design argument is he doesn't use it, despite the title of the books, to try and prove God. What his view is is a core, look at that type of approach. He looks in the first few lectures at astronomy and says, wow, look how big the universe is. Wow, look how amazing the orbits are. Wow, isn't this great? Or as young people today would say, isn't this awesome? Or isn't this cool? I'm not very young, as you can tell. Um, and then, after five lectures on that, what happens is he does another five lectures on the nature of revealed religion, the Bible. For Chevalier, it was the Bible that interprets the phenomenon, that gives the perspective. Tom Torrance talked about this in his own theology in the 20th century, when he talked about how natural theology has to be, in the very least, in dialogue with revealed theology, Christ at the center. That was my second point. You still with me, by the way? Thank you. Third thing is this. Christian doctrine of creation says that God is the sole creator. And I don't know if you picked up in the reading from Colossians. At that point in Colossians, Paul's a little like the kind of lecturer who has 42 PowerPoint slides, but only time for 10. <laughs> he just goes from one image to another image to another image to another image. Christ is uh, before all things in him all things were created, in him all things hold together. He keeps going on about image after image after image that all things are created in Christ. God is the sole creator of the universe. Uh, in him all things were created. Um, but let me show you one of my favorite uh, pictures at the moment. This is GNZ, GNZ 11. It's a galaxy. Astronomers have great imagination in naming their galaxies at times. And uh, this is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's expanded here as it's looked at this uh, object. This is a galaxy. It's quite a small galaxy. But I, uh, by that I mean it's only got about a few hundred million stars or so. And what makes this galaxy special is that the light from this galaxy has taken... Um, something like 13.4 billion years to reach us. The light from the sun takes about eight minutes to reach Liverpool, occasionally. Uh, <laughs> about eight minutes. Uh, the light from this galaxy has taken 13.4 billion years to reach us. Something in what J.B. Phillips once wrote, your God is too small. There's something about understanding that to say that God is creator is not just about creating me. It's an affirmation about the whole cosmos of 100 billion stars in each of 100 billion galaxies. And that God is the source of that. Now, what do I mean by that? In order to try and illustrate that, let's do a little bit of cosmology uh, for a moment. Are you up for this? Thank you. Uh, this is audience participation, by the way, as we go on. Um, what I've attempted to do on this slide is give the whole history of the universe on one slide. <laughs> Forgive me for being so bold about this. Um, our current age is, we think, about 13.8 billion years. Some of us feel it more than others at times. <laughs> and as we trace back the history of the universe, at the moment we think that our scientific models work <coughs> pretty well. Uh, to describe what the universe was like. We think we know what it was like when it was only a million years old. Uh, those of you who are mathematicians, this is not to scale, by the way. <laughs> In fact, we think we know what the universe was like when it was only one second old. And if that isn't sufficient, we think our scientific models work pretty well back to 10 to the minus 43 of a second old. Now, if you're not a mathematician, that's a shorthand way of writing 1 divided by 10 followed by 42 zeroths of a second. If you're a biologist or an engineer or a normal person, um, 
you'll basically say that's zero, isn't it? Well, not quite. At that point, our current models of physics break down. And uh, uh, we can't describe the very first moment of the universe's history. This is extremely frustrating. It's almost as if you've watched eight hours of Midsummer Murders, or <laughs> it just feels like that. And then just before the murderer is revealed, uh, someone phones you up. <laughs> and you miss who the murderer is. You've watched the whole story, uh, and you don't get uh, what happened right at 10 to the minus 43 of a second. The universe, by the way, 10 to the minus 43 of a second is very, very small. Fraction of a centimeter across, and it expands. And as it expands, it cools. Quarks, the building blocks of protons and neutrons, appear about 10 to the minus 35 of a second. Uh, the protons and neutrons get together to form uh, hydrogen and helium between about one second and a thousand seconds. Um, little bits of lithium and deuterium, but nothing much to write home about. And then to cut a very long story short, uh, uh, out of that hydrogen <laughs> come stars and galaxies uh, to form uh, planets as well. Now, the interesting thing and the frustrating part is, what do we make of the beginning? And the problem that our laws of physics have at the moment is that the two great theories of 20th century physics, quantum theory and general relativity, break down at this point. They can't cope with the universe being very big in a very small space. Um, and I won't go into the intricacies of that. If you'd like to ask about it, I'm happy to talk a little more about it. But as I said, for many physicists, it becomes very frustrating. Robert Jastrow, a number of years ago, in a book called God and the Astronomers, wrote about this. And forgive the sexist language, it was written a few years ago. He wrote, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He's scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for <laughs> centuries. <laughs> Do we insert God as the explanation of the beginning? Well, Pius XII and very distinguished Catholic layman, uh, professor of mathematics at Oxford University, E. A. Milne, uh, argued that. But it does seem to me that this is a problem of a god of the gaps. And indeed, if you know the work of Professor Hawking, Hawking reacts strongly against the sense that we simply insert God into the gap. And Charles Coulson actually talked about god of the gaps many years ago. He said, beware of putting God into any gap within scientific knowledge because as scientific knowledge increasingly fills in its own area, God is pushed out of the gap and becomes irrelevant. Now, it seems to me when we talk about the Christian doctrine of creation, we're not talking about a God of the gaps or, as the deist talked about, a God who simply starts off the universe and then goes for a cup of tea, not to have anything more to do with it. The image in Colossians is that in him all things hold together. It's an image of a God who sustains every moment of the universe's history. Um, a God who sustains not just the very first moment of creation, but every moment. And so as I talk to my colleagues in the physics department, one of the things, whether we're people of faith or not, that we're fascinated with is where do the laws of physics themselves come from? If Professor Hawking has a theory in terms of M theory leading to a quantum fluctuation, leading to an inflationary model of the Big Bang, I think one can say, where does M theory itself come from? Or quantum theory itself come from? That's not God of the gaps. Science assumes its laws. It doesn't explain where it comes from. Where the laws of physics come from is a philosophical, metaphysical, theological question, which I think the Christian faith can rightfully raise and say, here uh, is an explanation that this is creation and that the God who created the laws of physics is the one who sustains the laws of physics. 
So God is the sustainer of order, and uh, that phrase, in him th all things cohere, is a very important phrase for those of us who are physicists. For we do our work on laws of physics that are universal, by which the universe hangs together. And therefore, um, to explore those laws, to use those laws, is a Christian thing to do. And I wonder whether those of us, excuse me, who are part of churches actually affirm science as a gift and as a vocation. I, I'm sure you, go, you don't go to churches a bit like this, where if a young person says, I feel the Lord's calling me to the missionary field, some churches will bring that young person down, say, isn't that wonderful, lay hands on them, pray for them, give them a big check to go to study theology. But if a young person says, I want to do chemistry at university, I wonder whether the same church would bring them to the front and say, isn't that wonderful, let us pray for you, and by the way, here's a big check to help you with your student grant uh, in all of this. Kepler, you remember, found his vocation ultimately not as a priest, but as an astronomer. And what does it mean for us to rethink science as a Christian vocation. Uh, just a, a couple of years ago, uh, a friend of mine, a physicist in Durham, came up to me in the street with tears in his eyes and he hugged me. This doesn't happen a lot <laughs> in Durham and it certainly doesn't happen amongst physicists. It was the day of the announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves. You might remember it. Albert Einstein had said a hundred years ago, that if you imagine the space and time of the universe to be a stretchy fabric, he said, then uh, there may be an occasion when two black holes bang together and effectively you get little ripples on this fabric of space-time moving out. Um, he said, by the way, they'll be so small you'll never see them. Just like mobile phones kind of <laughs> setting off in the middle of lectures. You just get a little, little glimpse of it as it goes on. Well, this is, uh, this is what we think probably happened with uh, two black holes. Uh, so this is an animation of what happened uh, many, many light years away from us in a far off galaxy. Uh, these are two black holes here circling around each other. Now, what we've done underneath is represent the distorted space-time, the fabric of the universe. And uh, it's color-coded to tell you that time is moving at different rates in that space-time. Don't worry too much about that. Um, <laughs> what happens is the black holes spiral around each other, and then uh, they collide and we slow down the animation just because it gets to the dramatic part. Uh, you see this distortion in space-time gets more and more extreme uh, as they bang into each other. But what I want you to see are these little ripples moving out. Can you see those? Whoops. Sorry. Uh, let me go back. You've seen all of that. Let me remind you of it. Uh, those little ripples. And uh, this advanced LIGO experiment saw them. It did it by sending a laser beam of light in one direction, hit a mirror all the way back down the tunnel, 90 degrees, laser beam of light all the way back, combine those two uh, lasers together and ask the question, if space stretches by just a little bit, you'll notice it. And one of those ripples from those two black holes came along, this rippling space and time, and stretched the distance of this tunnel, stretched it by the fraction of the diameter of a proton. <laughs> Let me say that again. Stretched it by the fraction of the diameter of a proton, and we saw it. Now, how on earth can Einstein, thinking about the nature of space and time, 100 years before, predict that we'd see something on the Earth? from the interaction of two black holes. That's something about the universality of the laws of physics. 
something also about the simplicity of the universe underlying the complexity. There's something here for me which is a reflection of the faithful nature of God in sustaining the whole universe uh, through the trusted laws of physics. Right, I'm nearly there, so let me move to the end. Uh, I mean, the end of the universe is what I mean. And that is to say, fourthly, the Christian doctrine of creation has to be seen not just in the beginning, but also in the reality of new creation. Uh, I'm a Methodist, and therefore I'm under contract to mention the name of John Wesley in every <laughs> lecture that I ever give. Uh, on this occasion, he's actually relevant. Most of the time, he's not. Uh, Wesley read widely the science of his day, and uh, he was particularly interested in um, the concept of new creation embedded in the New Testament. For him, actually, it was the central category of hope, that there was a new creation of the individual, of the community, but also the whole created order and famously wrote a sermon called The General Deliverance, The Great Deliverance, which he uh, speculated about the future existence of dogs and cats post-death. Now, what's interesting about that was his uh, ability to try and speculate about the non-human creation in the future. Uh, that this wasn't about our souls being liberated from the body and floating up to some kind of shadow lands of heaven, but actually a renewal of the whole creation. And within the Colossians passage, if we had time, you'll see that Paul uses parallels here between creation and God's new creation, with Jesus as a fulcrum between the two. The sense that uh, God's work is for all creation, not just human individuals. And this is particularly interesting in the last couple of decades when we discovered that the end of the universe actually is not as attractive as we thought it once might be. And this was the discovery in 1998 and 1999 of the accelerating universe, for which uh, Saul Perlmutter, shown here with Adam Rees and Brian Schmidt, were awarded the Nobel Prize. And what they discovered was that the universe is accelerating at uh, a rate that we never expected it to do. So those old models of the universe expanding and then collapsing, you remember those and then perhaps bouncing, uh, that's not going to happen. The universe is going to accelerate. And the reason for that is because of the occurrence of something called dark energy. Now, within the universe, so these are different satellites which have measured these things, but broadly they're saying, um, uh, about 22%, 23% of the universe is in a form of matter which we call dark matter. We call it that because we don't know what it is. And uh, we think we know what it is, but we're not sure. We know that it's there, but we can't see it. And if that wasn't embarrassing enough, there's another 72, 73% um, in the form of dark energy. And we call it that because we've no idea what it actually is. <laughs> Now, you don't have to be a great mathematician to know that that means that I stand before you as an astrophysicist only knowing what 5% of the universe is made of. You may say, you've got a cheek, haven't you? <laughs> Come and give us a lecture about this. You only know what 5% of the universe is about. Well, yes, but we know that we only know what 5% of the universe is about. We're working on the rest. It's the dark energy that actually accelerates the universe. And... You might say, well, isn't that great? Uh, we'll, the universe will go on forever. The trouble is that as things get uh, ripped apart, eventually the universe cools and cools until it gets to a temperature where no life is possible. Now, that will be the case in about 20 billion years. So we're all right for a drink later this evening. But the end of the narrative, the end of a story, is as important as the beginning. We know that within the way that we tell stories. So how does the Christian doctrine of creation understand that? Uh, an end which Steven Weinberg uh, famously 
said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Well, at that point, I think a Christian understanding of new creation says, actually, there's something to talk about here. And that is that God's purposes go beyond this creation to a renewed, transformed heaven and earth. That's the Christian hope, not just taking us out of this creation. Just as when we look at human existence, I mean, in a sense, we're all destined to futility. We're going to die. But God's plans and purposes, his promises and his hope, are in the resurrection of our bodies, not simply some kind of uh, eternal existence. So I've talked about um, the Christian doctrine of creation, and I've talked about non-abstract academic concept. It's tinged with worship. I've tried to talk about Christ at the center. I've talked about God as a sole creation. I've talked about the end of the universe. Let me finish with something about what it means to be human and what Christianity contributes to what now, I think, is perhaps one of the biggest areas of the interaction of science and faith. Uh, because we are surrounded by questions about what does it mean to be human. Whether it be in the fact that my uh, genetic code uh, is shared, 67% of it is shared with cauliflower, you can probably tell that by looking at me. <laughs> uh, what makes us different in a physical sense uh, from the rest of the created order? And will I get to that point where um, uh, the robot who is caring for me in my old age starts to show some self-learning and self-programming? What point does that become consciousness? Um, human-like. We're a long way from that yet, but possibility. Which point, at what point do I have to ask my computer before I switch it off, if it's all right to do so? And then what about that uh, uh, concept that if one day we meet the little green women and little green men from another planet, what makes us different or the same? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Um, now it seems to me that it's too much of a theological cop-out simply to say, well, we're made in the image of God, because the obvious question is, what then is the image of God? And um, my own view, uh, for what it's worth, is that that's about the gift of relationship that God has given to human beings, intimate relationship. It's about the gift of responsibility that God has given for caring for the earth. Uh, it's about the sense of creativity. To be made in the image of God is about creativity. And that, of course, is wrapped together in a sense of community so that we can't be in the image of God simply as individuals. <coughs> I am in relationship to you, and you are in relationship to me, as uh, many of our African brothers and sisters will uh, talk about with such passion and knowledge. <coughs> and in this sense, I think that's where we bring something of a Christian understanding of anthropology into uh, this very complicated area, overlain by conflict models of the past, overlain by science that is developing all of the time. Not that we impose a Christian view as, let me prove to you this, or you have to accept that. But I hope in graciousness we can offer it in dialogue and say, let's talk about this together. And there are resources here within the Christian faith uh, which actually can be held in conversation with some of the scientific insights and some of the scientific answers. Uh, you've been very patient. Um, it's been a joy to give this lecture. Thank you very much indeed.
Well, David's given you a marvelous platform on which to speculate and think and reflect in the awe and wonder or perhaps be reminded of profound things at the heart of the Christian faith that we forget all too easily. But now you have time, 15, 20 minutes, uh, for us to take questions. I would ask that they should be relatively short, questions rather than statements. I'll take them in order, and we have a roving microphone. So if hands can go up, please, and I'll try and keep them in some order. Hands, hands, one there. Uh, just one, what's your viewpoint on the evolutionary algorithms? Yeah. Algorithms. Yeah. Okay, now they'll try. So, say again, evolutionary... Uh, uh, algorithms. What's your viewpoint on that? In terms of evolutionary logarithms, just say a little bit more uh, uh, to help me. Right, it's um, got this from Jeff Haskell, who's also an astrophysicist who uses the, the Hubble telescope. He says, first it's evaluation, and then selection, and then crossover, and then mutation, and then it goes over and over again. And to try and get better and better, here's a process, what works, does it, moves it on, and then what does work, we can. Thank you, evolutionary algorithms. Sorry, I heard logarithms, I thought. I uh, didn't understand that. That's my mistake. Um, well, of course, there is a sense in which the evolutionary process is an iterative process. That is, there is a sense in which uh, a number of possibilities are tried, and then there is a selection process. In Darwinian evolution, that selection process is scarcity of resources and uh, the ability to pass uh, characteristics down to the next generation. In astronomical terms, the, um, the process is the laws of physics interacting with a very big space, lots of possibilities. And so as you walk or wander through the universe, just like as you wander through a forest, you see lots of different things, sometimes failed stars, sometimes planetary systems. Now, um, I think for me, that's a reflection of a God who creates both law and freedom within the universe. So I think there is a, a limited amount of freedom within the universe for the physical processes to explore the possibility space. But that's within a defined set of rules or operations which um, are there to establish and um, extend fruitfulness. Now, one of the things that's really exciting, as, you, as you'll know at the moment, is our discovery of exoplanets. As we've looked out in the universe since 1995 and begun to discover that around many stars are planetary systems. To 1995, we didn't know whether there were any planets uh, beyond our own solar system. Uh, we now know about 3,500 of them. And it's quickly becoming uh, a sense that most stars, even if they're in binary stars, will have planets. But of course, many of those planets are not terrestrial and are not possibilities of life. They're too close to the star, they're too big, they're lots of possibility spaces. But about 150 of them are terrestrial, around the kind of stars that we uh, think are ours. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, that's really exciting. The trouble is, however, once we see that working out, we should be cautious not to make a big jump to say, well, therefore, there must be other life like ours if there are other Earths. And that's simply because, if I might use a phrase which is somewhat irreverent, it's a long way from an amoeba to an accountant. <laughs> Alan Kershaw. Um, the, uh, the, what I mean by that is that then you've got this interaction of biological evolution with the possibility space within the astronomical uh, sense. And so here you've got biology, chemistry, physics uh, working at different levels uh, with their own inherent rules because everything can't be simply reduced to physics, which is a long way for me to say what we need to be careful of this is to say that the only algorithms and the only rules are, are physics, a kind of reductionist thing which says once we understand the physics, that's all we need. In fact, the universe is uh, embedded at different levels and is fascinating for that. 
That's a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> Forgive me, but those are the type of things I want to say. Right at the back there, and then the gentleman in front after you. Thank you for participating to your talk. Thank you too for mentioning one of my heroes, Johannes Kepler. Yes. Who, by the end of his um, uh, conversion from the priest to the astronomer, came up with a great for creation yoga and that of um, Archbishop John Justice. Yes. Um, yes. Here's my question. The same apostle who wrote Colossians chapter 1 also wrote in 1 Corinthians, as in Adam all die, so in Christ yes. will all be made alive. Tell me about who you think Adam was. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, let me say, I'm a physicist rather than a biologist, so I'll defer to, to biologists in some way in this question. But your question is, is fair, and it asks a question um, of the biblical literature, and particularly Paul's understanding <coughs> of um, historicity within the Old Testament. And the parallel between um, uh, Adam and Christ, used also in Romans, um, has long interested theologians in terms of what Paul understood to be um, the historical nature of Adam as the first man. I, I think in terms of biblical exposition, uh, over a cup of coffee we could have a longer discussion about just how tight that <laughs> parallel is. But you asked me what I think of, of Adam. Um, and uh, I think my answer is, uh, well, I'm not too strongly of one opinion or the other on this. Let me tell you why. <coughs> it seems to me that there's no uh, undermining of biblical truth to say that uh, Adam is part of that way of characterizing history within what's technically sometimes called as myth, and that is stories that tell us about a greater truth. However, uh, it seems to me also that I can't rule out uh, the existence of a first man and a first woman. And the late Sam Berry, professor of genetics at uh, University College London, used to put it like this. Uh, Sam would say that one could have a situation where the evolutionary account produces um, uh, physiologically, biologically, uh, human-like beings. But in terms of the biblical understanding of what it means to be human, What's key to what it means to be human in the Bible is that gift of intimate relationship, that gift of responsibility. So some would say, perhaps at some point in the biological evolution of the species, God does something that God does throughout the Bible, and that is he takes the initiative and forms relationship. And so it could be that at some point God initiates a relationship with the first man and the first woman, Adam in that sense. Now, I, I actually think that both of those views can be held with integrity with what, what we might call evangelical Christianity, um, and indeed has been demonstrated within that fold over many years. Um, so I'm a little fence-sitting here on this one. Uh, this isn't my area of expertise, but I'm saying that I, want, I don't want to rule out either. Question over in the middle there somewhere. Did I see a hand earlier? Gentleman here, and then we'll go to the middle. Uh, thank you, David. In, in the light of the protests against a sixth extinction, the knowing us about the other side, <laughs> worry whether it's possible to survive anything on it. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, no, I, I'm not sure that we do. Uh, now, uh, uh, I worked a little bit on uh, the dinosaur ex extinction a number of years ago, and uh, popularly it's often seen as uh, the dinosaurs were wiped out by a, a comet impact. Uh, well, we do know that there's evidence that there was um, an impact at some point around that time. What's less clear is... Uh, whether that was the only thing that got the dinosaurs. If you look back in the 
terrestrial record of extinctions, there are a number of which um, there's a cyclicity to them about every 30 million years or so. And we certainly know that a comet is not impacting the Earth every 30 million years or so. There's just not enough of them for that to happen. And therefore, there must be another mechanism that may be causing those other extinctions. And uh, if I was a betting man, which of course I'm not being a Methodist, <laughs> then uh, um, um, uh, enhanced volcanic activity for me is probably one of the drivers. Um, and the dinosaurs may have just been unlucky <laughs> to have had both a comet and enhanced <laughs> volcanic activity at the time. But your point about uh, another extinction, uh, I mean, can I take that into the future? Because now, of course, <coughs> what we've introduced into all of that is our own ability um, to make uh, not just human life, but the whole of life on this planet vulnerable. And Lord Rees, who I referred to, uh, wrote uh, uh, um, a very, n not a book to be read at bedtime, called Our Darkest Hour, in which he talks about all of the possibilities, not just the environmental damage that we're doing uh, to the earth, but also uh, the possibility of constructing virus, um, which might wipe us all out in some pandemic. Um, the ability for us, of course, to destroy each other through uh, nuclear conflict remains a possibility, a whole number of others. And therefore that's led to uh, some thinkers to begin to argue that the only way that we can be less vulnerable is to start terraforming or moving onto <laughs> other locations so that the one location of the earth um, you don't... Uh, wipe out the whole of humanity if you mess up the earth. The difficulty of that, of course, is it's an avoidance technique. It avoids the morality <coughs> and the economic questions of how we care for each other and care for the earth. And at that, I'm not sure we uh, fully understand. Um, not, well, I mean, we understand a lot of the science. What we don't understand is how to act responsibly as human beings in all of this. And um, I think, you know, we've known the science about climate change for 30, 40 years. I think that's absolutely <coughs> clear that climate change is uh, human-led. Um, the question is a moral question, and that is, are we prepared to pay the price and change our lifestyles uh, <laughs> and to act responsibly as governments to do that? And this is where I think the faith communities have a particular part to play because it's about how we uh, change the human heart in that sense. Sorry, again, that's a very long-winded question, uh, but those are the type of things I, I want to say. A question in the middle here. Does science point towards an intelligence designer? And if so, should intelligence make your time a little shorter? <laughs> um, that's a question, two parts. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think that science points to an intelligent designer. Um, I think uh, one always runs the problem of a god of the gaps. I think science does pose questions about a deeper story to the universe. The problem, I think, of the design argument was um, the way that uh, an intelligent or loving God was smuggled in at the last point. So in a sense, you, you said, here's the evidence for a designer. Oh, and by the way, this is the Christian God. And so the two were conflated in that way. So I think at best, you can possibly argue for some kind of designer, but what's the nature of that designer? That's a crucial question. The crucial question often is not whether God exists or not. The question is, what is the nature of God or the nature of God that we uh, are attempting to encounter? So in that sense, I'm skeptical about intelligent design. I'm also a little skeptical of defining humanity by level of intelligence. Um, I think there have been attempts in Christian theology 
to reduce the image of God just to intelligence. And the trouble with um, uh, reason or intelligence as that which defines human beings um, is that it excludes some to the expense of others. Um, I think the value of relationship of that which is given as gift means that uh, for the person who um, uh, teaches at a university or, or the person who actually has limited brain capacity, we are both equal in the image of God. Um, and uh, therefore, I, I'm open to it being part of the image of God, as you suggest. And I might want to build not just a square, but a you know, many-sided dodecahedron or whatever it happens to be on this. But I think we should be careful of reducing that which defines human beings to one characteristic or quality. Lady there with the orange scarf. to speculate as a theologian. Please. In that if there is a life elsewhere, another mm. planet, mm. so to speak, yeah. um, will, will you, will we, expect them to take on the story of the Jesus of history, the Christ of faith, as we know it, or has been passed down to us, um, or will we be, need to be open to another form of revelation? Rightness would be we would be taught northern western yeah, theology, yeah. but we have to acknowledge now southern yeah. and other yeah. interpretations. Yeah. What would you expect to come yeah. from those facts? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a really important question, and it would be really crass of me to say that in that book I go into it in some detail, and it is coming up to Christmas and. Uh, <laughs> But let me, let me try and take the question uh, seriously without uh, doing that. Um, Stanley Yaki, a, a Roman Catholic theologian, uh, effectively says we won't know until we talk to them. And that actually he says that we Christians should be the first to greet the little green women and little green men <coughs> in, in order that we have some confidence that if God is the God of the whole universe, then we will have something in common, even if individual stories may change. And indeed, I mean, I do think that uh, Christian leaders would be, would be much preferable to President Trump uh, <laughs> greeting uh, any visiting aliens. One can't think of anything quite worse, really. Now, you pushed, however, rightly so to say, can we speculate about whether there will be a similar story or different stories? And in the 20th century, there was a great deal of debate about this. Uh, E.A. Milne, who I referred to earlier, uh, said that in his view, the Jesus story, particularly the events at Calvary, was so unique. It was a once for all for the whole universe. But he was then driven to say that our job was then to become cosmic missionaries, to tell this story throughout the universe. Now, that's a very long missionary journey. Um, he was opposed by a number of theologians, in, uh, including uh, Maskell, who in his Bampton Lectures in the 1950s said, uh, no, the God that I see in Jesus is a God who fundamentally becomes incarnate. And so there would be another incarnation on another planet. The difficulty with that is, first of all, um, our experience of incarnation is not just God demonstrating what God is like, but it's also something to do with salvation to people uh, uh, in <coughs> sin. And C.S. Lewis in his science fiction trilogy uh, speculated about whether other beings would have fallen in the same way that human beings would have done. The third thing is to, is to pose the question of whether if there are other incarnations on other planets, why might there only be one incarnation here on Earth? Now, incarnation 
for me, seems to be the supreme way in which God communicates, but isn't the only way. And your question rightly erased the question of other faith communities uh, who uh, hear something of God in different ways, but may not have incarnation in the same way that we do. So I think, uh, I mean, it's fascinating to think through because of the theological themes that come into it. Mm -hmm. Incarnation, redemption, sin, Mm -hmm. the way that God speaks uh, in many and different ways. And therefore, I've argued more recently that that the question that you've asked is a key, what I might call, theological sandpit question. It's a question where we might play in the sandpit and talk together and say, well, what about this and what about that? And there are some issues where um, you can speculate about that uh, in a way that sometimes the sensitivities of other questions closer to hand mean that we don't have the freedom to speculate. So play in the sandpit is, I think, the way to do it. Take one, one more question. There's some gentleman over there. This is the last one for the audience. Uh, my question is, if there is no creator God and we blow ourselves up, what's the point of the natural universe? <coughs> um, thank you. And I think that's where uh, Weinberg uh, was uh, trying to come to terms with, uh, he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. The more the universe is um, understood, the less one can actually talk about if we're alone, what's the purpose of it all. So I think uh, for me, uh, your scenario is, is very chilling. I think I'd want to flip it and say, for me, the existence of a creator God gives hope in the direst of circumstances. <coughs> so remember where I started with the Christian doctrine of creation is never an abstract co- concept. Uh, in Isaiah, for example, for a people who are in exile in Babylon, their hope of new creation, which was partly a political restoration back to Israel, was because they believed in a creator God who never tired, um, who was still committed to this universe. So the creator God of the past is the same God of the present and the God of the future. And that's what gives hope. We could talk for much longer, I know, but... We're trying to keep faith with the the clock. I want to ask David one thing very briefly because he's brought out so powerfully notions of God which are far more imaginative and exciting and awe-inspiring than perhaps we commonly achieve in liturgy and worship. So my question, comment (coughs) to you, David, is this. The the composer Vaughan Williams has a great work called The Sea Symphony, in which in one of the passages, as he contemplates the sea and the universe, uh, the American poet Walt Whitman, and he says this simply, quickly I shrivel at the thought of God. Would you just like to comment on that statement? Um, Rod, thank you for the invitation. (laughs) Hmm. Gosh, it takes me into so many different kind of areas which, which of course we want to have a, a, a long discussion about and that is first of all at a very basic level the way that art enables us to ask questions that science itself needs so there's something in our culture which is very important about the way that science is always in dialogue with humanities arts and the ability for us to um, Uh, to hold those two together, rather than the old C.P. Snow distinction of we live in two cultures. Um, And many of us specialize in science without encountering those questions of art, because art, um, whether it be in music or literature or uh, um, (coughs) sculpture, whatever it may be, and indeed this is true of popular culture as well, poses questions which often go beyond. Uh, our scientific uh, reductionism. 
I think the second thing to say is that it, it leads to a very interesting um, discussion of apologetics. I know Professor McGrath a couple of years ago uh, gave the lecture here and um, uh, he's rightly uh, said that part of the apologetic task is not just an intellectual engagement with the world by the Christian church, but is also um, the ability to build bridges imaginatively and here imaginatively from the culture. So there's something about that. But let me get back to the, to the uh, shrivel in the face of the God, thought of God. The thought of God. Um, I think, yes, the amazing thing is that God uh, is a living and active God who goes beyond our thoughts to restore um, the heart and mind which is shriveled, shamed, broken, um, struggling. That this is a God who goes beyond our ability to think about God in a way that um, moves to a knowledge of experience. And that's where I think that um, there is a, a personal knowledge, as Michael Polanyi talked about, which is beyond our intellectual understanding of God. Um, to use a very silly illustration, I might ask the question, how do I know that my wife loves me? <coughs> well, as a scientist, I can be very straightforward about that. Does she buy me a Valentine's card? <laughs> I mean, that would be evidence. Uh, does she scream and run out of the room every time she sees me? That would be evidence, but in a different direction. <laughs> but how do I know love is ultimately when I risk myself into a relationship. At that point, it goes beyond my intellectual understanding into a relationship of trust. Uh, and it's in the trust that the reality of love begins to inform me. Um, so, gosh, I mean, that's a very inadequate answer to a very profound question. But I think I'd, I'd want to go to that point where God is the God who's always taking initiative and forming relationship. Thank you. Um, we're almost through. I'm going to ask um, Reverend Dr. Peter McGrail in a few moments to propose a reflection and vote of thanks to David for a splendid uh, contribution to our thinking and indeed our believing. Um, before then, if I can just take you back to thought for the day which I mentioned um, earlier. D D David has asked that his fee that we are going to pay him, I hope, um, <laughs> will not be going to him but to a particular charity project that he supports back uh, home <coughs> at Durham, uh, which is very gracious of him, but we felt it wasn't uh, adequate simply for us to say thank you uh, at the end of the evening. So we do want to make a presentation to you now, David. You mentioned your wife. I'm going to ask my wife, Christine, to um, give you this. Uh, she, she has something in her hand, uh, I hope. And for one very simple reason, we both hear thought for the day, every, uh, virtually every day of the year at 10 to 8, and there's a standard kind of thing when it says, and now it's 7.53 time for thought for the day. And this morning it's Professor David Wilkinson, and she immediately shouts out, turn it up. <laughs> Many people say exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so on, on our, all our behalf, this is a small initial offering, David, in our thanksgiving. Peter, if I may call on you. <coughs> Professor Wilkinson, you closed your lecture by telling us that we'd all been very patient and by stating that it had been a joy to give this lecture. Well, you looked as you were, though you were enjoying yourself, that was certain. But I would respond that patience on our part was hardly needed. Time flew through that, even as you mapped the entire history of the universe onto a single slide. 
Certainly not, as you did note, to scale. <laughs> Perhaps but, uh, somewhere in there, there was one of those slight ripples in the fabric of space and time that you spoke about, but it certainly flew for me. And as for the pleasure, well, that was all ours. Right from that opening trio of clips in which deliciously you brought alongside each other the young Sheldon and Richard Dawkins. More, more, more. <laughs> And from that, open the challenge that we have sat through for the last hour or so. That challenge to the popular polar opposition of religion and science that those clips embody. And that, that vision that all too easily we have interiorised and continue to interiorise, even as we listen to John and other people on the radio and see on the telly. I personally want to really welcome your engagement with the design arguments, not, not only because I've never been particularly convinced by any of them, uh, frankly, that goes right back to Aquinas, uh, and <laughs> your refusal to take up the God of the Gaps approach that I take from here with, with a sense, I must say, even of joy. Your response refused to engage in that manner. Instead, it was Christo Christocentrically focused and therefore profoundly human. We ended up in exactly the right place, in a sense, with anthropology. Um, indeed, as your responses to the questions that you've just been asked made clear, your vision of the universe and of our place in it is profoundly humane. Now, you have spoken as a Methodist, and I must confess that at one point, that is before my phone interrupted your <laughs> flow, for which, to everybody, my apologies. Um, there'll be a prize for anyone who can name that tune. But before that, I was going through, in my mind at one stage, those classic lines of Wesley, finish now thy new creation. If I might draw on my own Roman Catholic tradition, I would say that one of the most dramatic statements and most profound insights of the Second Vatican Council was in its, in its insistence that it is only in Christ that humanity is fully revealed to itself and becomes fully apparent to itself. What you have done is to set that vision into a truly cosmic scale. Surely a common Christian error is to perceive even that amazing self-revelation as bounded by our own limited experience of space and time. Instead, what you have invited us to do is to understand our very humanity in terms of the cosmic scale of the universe. And as you suggested at the start of your lecture, that can only lead us to one place, which is to worship. So, Professor Wilkinson, thank you very much. <laughs> Having introduced the theme of worship, I have to finish with it. <laughs> There's only one response to all of that, and that's awe. So let's have a moment of, of, of silence as we place ourselves in that scale of time and space and in the relationship with that cosmic Christ. May the one who fills all things, may the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, May the one in whom all things have their being enlighten our minds, deepen our trust in his Father's goodness and lead us out into the service of all living things. Jesus Christ himself. Amen. <laughs>